Unrest in Armenia, an armed siege in the capital leads to protests calling for the president to step down. People accuse him of making too many concessions in the conflict in Nakorno karabakh Will the ongoing tension be contained? Or could Armenia slip into further turmoil? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. For nearly two weeks, Armenian police officers and opposition supporters have been stuck in a cycle of violence. Gunmen barricaded themselves in a police station in the capital Yerevan on July the 17th. They're holding several medical workers hostage, and demonstrations supporting the gunmen have grown steadily. Protesters have gathered repeatedly near the police station where the gunmen are holed up. Security forces have responded with stun grenades and tear gas. At least 60 people were injured in the violence on Friday. Now, the protesters and gunmen want the same thing, for police to release jailed opposition leader Zahir Selfilian. He's a former military commander and the head of the founding parliament. It's a fringe political group pushing for President Zahre Zakisian to resign. Most of the movement's members are veterans of the National Army. They say Zakisian has become corrupt and too powerful. And they also say the government has mishandled the long-running conflict in nagorno karabakh That's a region officially in Azerbaijan with Armenian-occupied territory to the west. Most of the population is ethnic Armenian, and that led to six years of war between the Azeri forces and Armenian-backed separatists, ending with a peace agreement in 1994. But fighting flared up for four days in April. It was the worst incidence of violence in recent years. Now, Moscow brokered a ceasefire to halt the fighting, but sporadic shooting still happens through the night. And the founding parliament group says that the Armenian government has lost too much territory in recent fighting. Well, let's bring in my guests for this edition of Inside Story. In Yerevan, we have Richard Gagosian. He's the director of the Armenian think tank Regional Studies Center. In London, we have Lilith Gavorgian. She is the Russia and Caucasus analyst at IHS Market. And in Yerevan, via Skype, we have journalist Maria Titisian. Welcome to all of our guests on this edition of Inside Story. It's been a hectic uh, several months, certainly. Uh, Maria, I'd like to come to you first in Yerevan. Forget you're a journalist. Tell me what the last 36 hours has been like briefly, just as a resident of Yerevan with all the events that have unfolded. Well, for all of us who have been following the unfolding events, we have done so with a, a very heavy heart. Uh, last night, uh, from my balcony, I could hear explosions and gunfire. Um, I was following three live feeds as, uh, as they were being reported, and particularly devastating for me was the targeting and attack against uh, journalists who were trying to do a brilliant job bringing the story to the world. Lilith, can I, can I bring you in here? From the outside uh, of Armenia, it's perhaps the strangest scenario. A group of armed men, they attack and take control of a police station uh, in support of a detained politician, and in doing so, get hundreds of people out onto the streets supporting them, despite taking medics hostage, as they have at the moment. Civil society groups outside of Armenia perhaps would rarely support such actions. So why are Armenians feeling so strongly that they have to support what's going on? I think um, simply because they saw this as an opportunity, as a last resort, because um, many of them who came out, they don't see any potential of finding a political solution to the problems that exist within the country and also um, with regards to the Nagorno-Karabakh region that you mentioned. So for many, this this was seen as a spark that, um, that was um, um, an outlet for all the discontent that people had uh, regarding the, the foreign policy issues and as well as the economic issues. Uh, Richard Gogoshin, can I bring you in here? You're nodding in agreement. Uh, obviously, you're in Yerevan. You're there at the heart of public debate at, at, the, at the university as a visiting professor. What are you agreeing with, uh, with what Lilith said? Well, I think Lilith was very correct in terms of the 
hostage standoff was very much a catalyst as much as a cause. This was a trigger to an underlying trend of discontent. In many ways, the wave of so-called support are really protests and manifestations, not directly for the gunmen themselves, but for the desperation of their act. And it reveals the deeper undercurrent of discontent within the country. After all, this is the third in the last three years where Armenia has been configured by a series of, of activists and a wave of public demonstrations. Indeed. Uh, Maria, you're also nodding your head. I want to bring in another question now that uh, Safilian leads a small political party, as we've just mentioned, from various political backgrounds, mainly uh, former military officers. Are the public clear about what they are protesting about? Because you have the issue of uh, Safilian's arrest, or is it more about uh, presidential power and the way the government treat the public? It, and you say it's a spark about discontent about a lot of issues. Well, certainly. I mean, uh, there's a lot of domestic issues from impunity to corruption to injustice to uh, a basically, uh, you know, a, a, I don't want to say collapsed economy, but a malfunctioning economy. The issue of nagorno karabakh the, the very recent April war, where we lost about 100 soldiers in certain territory. So all of these things uh, have amounted to this. And I agree with my, uh, with my colleagues here. Uh, this isn't, we, we, we're all feeling this internal dilemma. We understand the intent. We do not agree with the methods that they utilize. And I think a lot of people are there not simply to support the government. We need to be clear about this. And it's about the massive grievances and uh, the lack or loss of hope people feel today in Armenia. Uh, and, and that has been the reason. And then certainly the heavy police crackdown last night uh, is certainly not going to uh, help the situation. That's certainly the wider picture. Uh, Richard, you're nodding your head. I'd just like to get your impression of uh, Safilian as a political leader and a, and a leader of a political party. I mean, how significant is he in the much larger um, uh, um, umbrella of, of Armenian politics? Where does he stand and where does his party stand? Well, in many ways, that's a good question, because the dilemma here in Armenia, realistically, honestly, is that this was inevitable, largely because the political system now is where the ruling political elite is ruling the country and not governing the country. And it's been very dangerous for any incumbent government, but especially this one, to so willfully ignore popular demands for change and reform. In the face of such socioeconomic pressure, a lack of political democracy, where Armenia's last free and fair election was its first many decades ago. In other words, this is a sense of accumulated rage in terms of the arrogance of power in which this particular government has become the most unpopular in Armenian history. Having said that, an equally sound indictment of presidential leadership is the absence of presidential leadership. The Armenian president and much of his government have, have been surprisingly passive and moot in a time of national crisis. Perhaps it was an attempt to placate and to play for time, but in many ways it's a repeat of the American Al Pacino movie Dog Day Afternoon, where there's no way out and no way back for either the protesting masses or the, the government itself. That's why it's very difficult to return to the need for moderation concession and compromise, which is as alien to the government as it is to the protesters in their demands. And of course those demands, uh, Lilith, if I can bring you in, you're nodding there in London, I'm sure you'll agree with what some of the things that Richard has said. But I think uh, one particular point that highlights perhaps that the problems that, are, that Armenians face is that, for example, Safilian is a Lebanese-born Armenian, moved to Armenia 20 years ago, has not been able to get Armenian citizenship. If you feel disenfranchised as an individual and you've already fought for the country in a war, you, you do feel lost when your own government and officials aren't really supporting you in your principal need of identity. And this is what I think you would all agree that the people on the streets have, have no voice, have, feel they have no identity, they don't belong to those that are in fact ruling them. I will take a step back and I will, um, although today we're talking about Armenia, I have to say that this is a problem that we will see in other parts of the former Soviet Union. We're really talking about a system of government which is oligarchic system. In a nutshell, the business 
and uh, the political power is concentrated in the hands of very few. And what happens in time, there's a concentration of wealth in the, in the hands of very few, and the people become also politically disenfranchised. Not only they lose economic opportunities, um, because the, doing big business or any lucrative business is a privilege of, the, of the, those who are at the top of the political power, but also they are they are not given any um, chance of effectively shaping the policies, whether they're domestic or foreign policy. Add to that um, heavy tax burden, um, in, uh, non-independent courts, and sometimes pr um, you know, police brutality, as we've seen um, in its most um, extraordinary form last night, then there isn't really much left for, uh, for a status quo. I want to make a point um, why Armenia didn't see this sort of political violence <clears throat> in the past. And I, th I think the watershed moment mm. was the April war. And that's because I think, by and large, the public was reluctant to go for any dramatic changes. Um, they were sort of straight jackets um, issues. And one of them was, we have to keep peace internally, otherwise uh, our adversary, mm. um, Azerbaijan, may take advantage of this political instability and attack Nagorno-Karabakh. Another thinking was, well, we're still, uh, we, we're not necessarily happy with this oligarchic um, structure, but at the same time we don't know how to change it. And any attempt of, for example, staging Ukraine-style revolution will really upset our relations with Russia. Let me bring in Maria Russia's here. Let me bring in Maria here because she was also nodding. And Maria, can I uh, basically want to bring you in on the on the basis that. Um, the, the fact that there is a disconnect between those that are in government and the people on the streets, the oligarchy that uh, Lilith has mm -hmm. uh, mentioned, is actually because y Armenia does a lot of business with Russia. There's a lot of connections with Russia, and Russia holds a, a very strong, you might say, wouldn't say grip, but has a very strong influence uh, in and around Armenia. Uh, primarily because Armenia thinks of it as a strong ally and financially it's very connected, which is why Armenia, you might say, turned its back on any Eurovi uh, European incentives to join it economically. How, how close is that connection and how difficult is it or would it be to cut those ties? Well, Armenia depends very heavily uh, upon Russia, both militarily, economically, perhaps uh, even politically, strategically. We have a Russian base, the 102nd base here in Gyumri, the second largest city in Armenia. We are a member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization along with Russia. Um, so the ties are very strong. Uh, sometimes they, are, they can be suffocating. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I just do want to make it clear that this, this latest outburst is not necessarily something that's similar to a Euromaidan. Uh, I think the issues stem more from domestic uh, woes than from Armenia's. Uh, it, it's certainly an indirect impact of that kind of relationship. But I just want to also touch upon one thing that Lilith said, that uh, you know, the uh, success of Armenian governments have sort of appealed to the population to say, you know, let's not have civic unrest. We need stability. You know, the enemy is at the gate. Uh, we need to maintain some kind of decorum in the country. Uh, having said that, when the April war began on April 2nd, uh, that lasted several days and was very devastating, I would say, for both sides, uh, Armenia was not facing internal crisis at that point. Uh, so the governments have been using this. And I think that a very important point that needs to be made is that when we strengthen the pillars of democracy in Armenia, in Azerbaijan, and in the region, those are the the the, guarantee, the guarantors of any kind of future peace agreement or some kind of peace deal. But as long as we keep using the Gharapakh conflict as an excuse not to fix or clean up our own house, we will not be able to move forward. Uh, Russia in that sense certainly isn't helping because it sells arms to Azerbaijan, it provides and sells arms to Armenia. So basically it is arming both of its strategic partners, if we may call them that, mm. uh, who are at war with one another. So where does Russia come in on all of this, and, uh, Richard, if I can bring you in here? Does not does Russia realise that this will actually come back and, dare I say it, bite them on the posterior if they actually don't act and try and help these two uh, find a solution to their political and geographical impasse? 
Well, generally, I'm concerned. I'm concerned for two reasons. One is, after 14 days of this crisis, how do we climb back down and step back from the brink? But my second concern is about the Russian reaction, because in many ways, there's a finite number of days or a limit to the patience with which Moscow will look at brewing instability in Armenia, its only foothold in the South Caucasus, and may be tempted to intercene or intervene in a very destabilizing way. But moreover, what the April clashes were so significant for was also in terms of injecting a new degree of crisis in Armenian-Russian relations, where Armenia prudently is now seeking its own reset of Russian relations based on the asymmetry and the arrogance with which Moscow treats Armenia. This actually makes the situation now domestically that much more complicated and far too inviting or tempting for Russia to actually react or respond. Mm. And much of our concern is the lack of vision by the Armenian government, a automatic instinctive reflex to the use or overuse of force last night, an egregious beating of journalists, attacks on unarmed civilian protesters, which was clearly beyond the pale. And in many ways, there is a, a limit to the patience of even the Armenian population after this accumulation of frustration. Let me just bring in um, a pause there for, for you because I'd like to also bring into this uh, conversation what Europe has had to say. Now, European leaders have called for swift solution to the unrest in Armenia. The Secretary General of the Council of Europe, John Vaughan Yaglan, says, and I quote, I would like to recall that in states governed by the rule of law, all conflict should be resolved through political dialogue with a respect for democratic norms and standards. I therefore call on those concerned to put an end to this dangerous situation without delay and to return to the use of democratic means. Certainly, it seems that Europe is concerned, but not concerned enough, Lilith, to actually get involved. They're allowing one would assume, are they, allowing Russia to really take the driving seat and, and sort this out, or for even Armenia and Azerbaijan to really sit down, if they ever can, and talk to each other? Yes, I think um, what the, from the European Union perspective, um, the, uh, any use of violence is uh, obviously uh, very dangerous. And from their point of view, there has to be a dialogue within Armenia, within different parts of um, Armenian society. And I think it was a message um, to the political establishment to actually um, show some will and presence, um, at least, that uh, they are taking steps to negotiate, to acknowledge that this is not just about hostage taking, but it is about deeper issues. And just suppressing them will not really stabilize the country. It's only postponing the problems that they have to deal with. Um, it's very interesting that there is quite a difference between what the Europeans are saying and what the Russian position was. And I think from the Russian perspective, this was seen as a simply an act of terrorism that has to be extinguished immediately from Russian perspective, unless you manage to bring out um, almost half of the population on the street and you prove that this has nothing to do with the West or Western-sponsored NGOs, then there is a chance of some change and this is the problem and I think um, perhaps um, Russia is also just like the Armenian government is underestimating how deep those social problems are and how unhappy people are with the current economic situation and the security situation on the border. Okay I'll come to you in a moment Richard I can see you nodding your head I want to go back to Maria again because obviously civil society groups and international human rights watchers uh, have been very critical uh, about the way the authorities have dealt with this but also very concerned about the way the public is being treated, those that are out are on the streets protesting. What sort of a message uh, is President uh, Sarkassian actually getting from the public and, and what do you think his next move should be? Nobody can second guess him. He's made no public statements about what's gone on, Maria. Right. Well, if I was President Serge Sarkassian's advisor, uh, I would tell him that he needs to start a dialogue with the population. First of all, he needs to de-escalate the situation, uh, call back the heavy-handed response by police, ensure that there is no more further uh, police brutality. He has to see concessions not as a defeat, 
but as a way to start addressing the issue. Uh, because the more that they try to um, sort of put, uh, you know, uh, try to to pretend that, as Lilit was saying, that this is simply a terrorist uh, uh, action and uh, it's, it's, it's an isolated thing. It is not an isolated thing. Uh, one interesting thing I want to come back to that you kept asking us and we somehow managed not to answer, Jir Sefilian and his founding parliament did not have mass uh, support in the country. They were seen as a fringe group. They were very radical, very militant, and any initiative that they did undertake prior to this one there were not uh, a, a lot of people who were uh, their followers. But this was the catalyst. And I think that Serge Sarkisian should take this opportunity to really have a dialogue. But, you know, f for, for those of us living in Armenia, we feel like the government and the president is on vacation uh, and nobody is talking to the people. The people have been left rudderless, leaderless, and we do have a crisis of leadership in this country. And he has to address it. Well, that's what Maria said. Uh, Richard, you were nodding in agreement about some of the things she said. Would you agree? What, what, what advice would you have for the president if he's watching this program? Let's hope he is. Well, I would make two, po I would make two specific points. First of all, President Sartian is well known within Armenia for being a chess uh, player. In many ways, if he is such a strategic chess player, he's obviously in danger of forfeiting the match without even engaging. In other words, what we see is a leadership vacuum that is a lack of political coherent demands either by the protesters and a, matched by a lack of coherent concessions by the government. What this also reveals is the lack of a real constructive opposition in the face of an increasingly authoritarian government and its response. But the second point is equally significant, and that is we all share responsibility in this current crisis. The gunmen themselves in their criminal act are now actually, after releasing the initial police hostages, have so has seized a group of doctors and ambulance workers. This is beyond the acceptable and in many ways risks their losing popular standing and support, but in many ways protest leaders have an equally profound responsibility not to overly endanger or put at risk the innocent civilian population by trying to provoke an incident with the police in some cases. But in many ways, just as the guilt and liability is equally shared, we all have a stake in the outcome and the future. And there is one thing clear for the Armenian president and the, and the silent government. There is no going back. There is no return to normalcy. The status quo previously has become egregiously and now demonstrably unacceptable. OK, let me just then come to the final question. Maria, just your final thoughts. With so much going on in the world at the moment, Syria, Iraq, ISIL, Turkey, the spate of terror attacks uh, across uh, Europe and the United States, does the world really care about Armenia? And why should the world care about what's going on in Armenia and its relationship with Azerbaijan? Uh, well, we often feel that we are a forgotten corner of the planet here in Armenia. You know, the South Caucasus, people don't even know where it is on the map. Um, I think the world needs to care because we are sitting on a tinderbox. And if full-scale full war were to erupt in this region, look at the players. There's Turkey, there's Russia, there's Iran. Uh, so I think that we are at a crossroads uh, in terms of our geography, uh, and uh, the world needs to pay attention. We are on the doorsteps uh, of Europe, and the, this latest war where there were... Uh, uh, horrific mm -hmm. war crimes that uh, were conducted on the doorstep of Europe, I think that the world needs to pay attention and see what is taking place uh, at its doorstep. And there we have to leave it to uh, Maria Tatishian, uh, to Richard Gogoshian, and to Lilith Gavogian. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for, from London and from Yerevan. It's been a, a really good half hour with you all. And uh, thank you very much for watching Inside Story. You can, of course, see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash Al Jazeera Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the whole team, thanks for your time and your company.